Okay, welcome to the World Teach webinar on teaching and living in Thailand. Uh, thank you for joining us out there. We have listeners on the line from around the world, so we're excited to start the conversation. Amongst our listeners, we have some new applicants, those that have just been accepted to the program, and others that are just interested in learning more about World Teach and our Thailand program. We also have panelists joining us, both an alumna and our field staff, our current field director. So thank you, everyone, for being here. So to start, let's go over our agenda quickly. We'll spend a few minutes meeting our great panelists and learning a bit about their backgrounds. Then we'll get into the specifics of our Thailand program. This includes our partnership with local schools, why there is a need for World Teach volunteers, the support that's provided for volunteers, including funding from our partners, and what the remaining volunteer fee covers. From there, we'll focus on being in the classroom, how are placements made, and when will you receive them? What teacher training will you receive during orientation? What sort of resources will or won't you have in the classroom? We'll discuss the option of TEFL certification and, most importantly, cultural challenges that our alumni faced in their schools and in the community. After, we'll discuss living in Thailand. What are the housing placements like? And with whom will you be living? What is the monthly stipend? What activities are volunteers involved with outside the classroom? We'll talk about safety, cultural challenges, and we'll get to hear the personal experience from our alumna on the line with us. At the end, we'll quickly address volunteer qualifications in the application process before we dedicate time to, to Q&A with our panelists. Throughout the webinar, you can submit questions to the chat function that you should see on the bottom of your screen. We have staff on the line that are ready to answer your questions, and some we may wait to address until the end as a group. So let's continue. So quickly, uh, myself, my name is Nolan, and I'm the Director of Communications and Recruitment here at World Teach. I was a teacher in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Brazil for four years. I uh, both taught in a high school there and at a NGO in Hosinha, which is the largest slum slash favela in Latin America. I did my undergraduate work at Penn State, and after years of being in the business world, I became a teacher, completed a couple of master's degrees, and now have been working in the education field for eight years. Next, we have Jen Greer on the line with us. Jen is our current World Teach Field Director in Thailand. And Jen, if you can, if you're there, I know good evening to you. Well, good morning to you. It's 7 a.m. In, in Thailand. Um, would you like to introduce yourself to those who are listening in? Yeah, good morning or good evening, everyone. Um, so I first came to Southeast Asia when I was a teenager, and I really fell in love with the region. Um, and I... So it was kind of a natural progression when I started my undergraduate work at Harvard to kind of do uh, go to um, I lean towards social anthropology and with a focus in Southeast Asia. And my undergrad research was in Burmese migrant workers in Thailand. But then after I graduated, I came and I was a World Teach volunteer with the Thailand program um, in its second year, and that really kind of me, along with a lot of other volunteers I know, was kind of a paradigm shift. So when I went back to the States after completing my year, I got my MA in Asian Studies, again, with a focus in Southeast Asia um, and Thailand. And I was looking at specifically the region of uh, Isan, where, we're current, where World Teach Thailand is currently based, because this is an area that's rapidly developing and there's a lot of really awesome, amazing things that are happening both with the culture because the Isan culture is so um, interesting because it's always been a really uh, place where a lot of um, migration has happened between Laos and between uh, Thailand. So it really has its own distinctive concept, which I really clicked into. And then when I finished up, I came back to World Teach Thailand because I love this region, and I think this is a great program, and I've been now here since the last April start program, and uh, yeah, I think we're rolling along pretty well here. Awesome. So how did you first find World Teach Gen? I found it through the social anthro department at, um, at Harvard, because, and um, talked to a bunch of people, and it was something that fit the bill. I knew that I wanted to 
East Town was one of the few places in Thailand where I hadn't spent a lot of time. So this was also one of the few programs that allowed me to come up and do extended, live for extended period in uh, Thailand. And this is um, in Isan. So what sounds when I was viewing, uh, doing the applications, it was a good fit for me. And I like it a lot, which is why I'm back here. Awesome. Okay, very cool. Thank you. Okay, next on the line we have an alumna, Patricia Ferrero. She was in Thailand in the initial year that we started in the Isan region in 2009. Uh, as well, Patricia, who's currently living in Denver and coming in live from Denver, Colorado. Um, would you introduce yourself as well to the attendees? Hi, um, so my name is Patricia and I'm originally from Los Angeles, California. And um, I attended Boston University and while I was at Boston I kind of knew that I wanted to do some work abroad and I was originally considering doing the Peace Corps but then I found out about World Teach and so I ended up going to Thailand for its initial year which was an amazing experience. And um, since then I ended up staying an extra year in Thailand on my own working at an elementary school. After that I went back to the States and I found out that I just didn't want to be there <laughs> very long so I ended up going to Guatemala and to Mexico and working there for a few years and now I'm back I've decided that I wanted to study public health and so I'm in Denver doing that studying and um, working at an environmental organization. Thank you Patricia. Um, and how did you first find World Teach? Well it was when I was um, doing research on the Peace Corps and at Boston University there was a, um, I guess, kind of like a career fair, and that's where I found World Teach. And I did some research on both organizations, and I ended up um, deciding that World Teach just fit what I wanted so much better than the Peace Corps. Um, it seemed, it just seemed like a better fit. I really liked what I read about it. It seemed like everybody that volunteered with World Teach had amazing things to say and the more I read about it and the more I researched it the more I just realized that this was this was the right thing. And just curious as specific as you've been you've been all over the world now in, in both uh, Latin America as well as Southeast Asia why, why Thailand specifically to start? I, I really wanted something very different and I I've always just been very intrigued with Asia, especially Southeast Asia and South Asia. And when I found out that this was going to be the inaugural year, I thought it sounded like a really great adventure. And at the moment, I wanted something that was completely different from what I was used to, and I really got that experience. It was very different. Um, and so it was, it was exactly what I was looking for. Um, after that, I realized that it was, I, I wanted something a little bit more familiar, so I ended up going to Latin America, which um, being a native Spanish speaker, it was just much easier for me to get into that culture. But Thailand was exactly what I was looking for. It was very different and exciting, and the culture was beautiful. And I, I just wanted something that was going to really force me to get out of my comfort zone. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. I think it's that part that when you're, you feel like you're out of your comfort zone, but then your your comfort zone becomes the place that was uncomfortable, and then things kind of switch around. Uh, I definitely relate to that of of coming back and forth between your your original home and and sometimes where you feel like a local around the world. Um, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Patricia. Um, so quickly, as you see on this next slide here, um, we have World Teach in Thailand. Um, we've been in Thailand now in this region for seven years. We were first invited back in 2009 by the Nakhon Panam Department of Education and the Thailand Laos Cambodia Brotherhood. We wouldn't be in Thailand without this partnership as World Teach only works in communities where we have been invited. Today we continue working in the Nakhon Panam province for many reasons. In general, Thailand's economy depends heavily on tourism. And therefore, in major cities, you'll find more resources dedicated to English learning. But rural village schools in the Nakhon Panam province receive the bare minimum of government funding. 
Therefore, you will find local Thai English teachers who don't speak English nor have the confidence to speak with their students. And of course, this is going to affect student learning. Jen, do you want to address anything on the relationship between World Teach and the schools that we work with? Uh, yes, uh, we Nukumpanom is different than uh, a lot of, uh, or the Thailand program is different than a lot of other World Teach programs, in the fact that we have uh, MOUs, uh, Memorial of Understandings, with every single one of our school partners, as well as our uh, the primary and secondary office in Thailand. So that means that in, in the company of Thailand, which means that we have a pretty long-standing relationship with most of our teaching partners in our teaching schools, and the re we continue to put back uh, put volunteers in a lot of our schools that have had volunteers since the beginning, because the schools that seek us out in particular really want to give their students. Think about the long term, not just uh, for their students. They think about why, if they could, these students could go down south and work in the tourism industry, and also this region is changing rapidly. Um, in two and a half years ago, almost three now, uh, the Thai Lao Friendship Bridge in Isan in the Kompanom and Isan of for in this area of Isan opened up, um, and as a result, just in the past four years since I was a volunteer, the province has developed rapidly along with ASEAN is opening up. And for a lot of, sorry for all of you who are, uh, <laughs> the ASEAN for everyone who isn't familiar with is um, in a collection of Southeast Asian countries that have recently, it's the equivalent for most the easiest analogy would be it's like the EU for Southeast Asia. And for the student, uh, they've, for the students here, this is important, ASEAN opening up because English is the primary language for our business in ASEAN. But students up here and the teachers up here, they, as you were saying, they don't have any access to native English speakers. And to go circle back around, the, uh, the Thai teaching partners and the school principals and the school, uh, that we have here, they recruit us and they want us in because they see that their students need these skill sets and need to interact with foreign teachers uh, and native English speakers so they can get a strong foothold in the emerging markets in this area and possibly be able to get better jobs um, down south as well. Um, it's an interesting place because the biggest thing that we do have there is just, um, since we are one of the few programs that provides native English speakers up here, we are kind of, we're well known and, but one of the biggest things we face is that we have uh, to deal with people just being scared to speak English. And it's a constant battle for all of us uh, because they don't want to lose, uh, make a mistake and embarrass themselves. And this is something that our Thai teaching partners are really passionate about, kind of promoting with their students so they get over this fear, and that's why we're here. Sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, don't be sorry. That was that was awesome. The, it, it's a fine line. You think about the Asan initiative that that balance maybe you see in the the Isan region of preserving their identity and their culture versus some gentrification and and parts that uh, the globalization neoliberal policies that are allowing all these businesses to come in have you seen uh, some locals losing jobs or some influx of more of a diversity of people just to quickly oh most definitely okay. most definitely um, you know, when I was a volunteer, it was, we knew every single foreigner and we could spot in the, who lived in the province. And seeing a tourist was very rare. Um, now, you know, seeing back, we're getting backpacker tourists coming through here on their way over to Laos and Vietnam. Um, the, um, and as a result, a lot of bigger businesses are moving into this area because things like land prices are increasing, and that's pushing out a lot of 
um, rural farmers that have been forced to sell off their land. And this has traditionally been a rice farming area of Thailand. And as a result, the entire economy is changing and it's becoming much more based upon the money, the remittances that um, uh, children send back uh, who go. Uh, go to work, uh, family members used to go to work in urban areas or go to work in even cities like Phnom are able to at the factories and emerging, you know, larger stores and hotels are able to send back to their families in the smaller villages. And it's a major change and it's also something that we don't want to, by not uh, kind of promoting English in this region, in this uh, province, you know, we don't want to kind of, uh, by not, the kids not getting, sorry, by the kids not getting, um, ex being exposed to English on a regular basis in this province puts them at a major disadvantage in the long term and getting uh, jobs in this region and in other parts of Thailand. So. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Jen. Um, it's a complicated situation. Uh, as we move along, um, and mm -hmm. we'll circle back to these numerous things, um, we look quickly at the support for volunteer and the volunteer contribution. So as we look at this quickly, um, what does the volunteer fee cover? As you'll see in the list, it, it is extensive, but it's first important to note that the schools that we partner with in country subsidize the program substantially. The total program costs are generally around $10,000 per volunteer, but our, th our Thailand partners provide the majority of the funding and the volunteer pays the remaining $1,500 plus airfare. Our volunteers do a lot of fundraising in their local communities because as you can see, this is a lot of money. World Teach can provide you with fundraising ideas. Uh, there is a link on our website and I can provide that to you if you email and can connect you with previous alumni as well who were successful in raising all their volunteer fees and sometimes more. The fees cover things such as your Thailand work visa, housing, the monthly stipend, health and emergency evacuation insurance, orientation and training conferences, field staff, and a remote teacher quality coordinator to provide support for lesson plans and teaching resources, as well as monitoring of the lessons you do in class. We'll touch more on our training aspects next, which is the major pillar of our volunteer support. So moving along here. So again, many of you are out there or thinking or listening in. Um, I've never taught before. How will I know what to do? World Teach takes their orientation training very seriously, and it is something we have a, a great reputation for in this, this particular field. Um, the first month upon arriving to Thailand is exclusively dedicated to the orientation. The group will have teacher training sessions each day, complete a short teaching practicum, and receive feedback on their teaching from fellow volunteers and field staff. Volunteers will also receive a curriculum that has been designed specifically for the schools and students that we teach in Thailand. Each volunteer, as mentioned, is assigned a coordinator in our teacher quality program in our U.S. office in Boston, who is in contact monthly with you to help you with lesson plans, provide additional materials, and teaching resources. Volunteers will also have daily Thai language immersion classes because the majority of the volunteers that are going to go, like yourself, uh, won't know the language before arriving to the country. Uh, Jen, just quickly back to you, then Patricia, I have a lot of questions that are going to come your way. Um, Jen, since you oversee all the volunteers and their schools, what sort of resources are most classrooms equipped with or lacking? And how is the English level of the Thai English teachers? Um, in most schools, you'll probably have one or two head, uh, Thai English teachers. Uh, in, uh, English teachers, or maybe probably one head te English teacher who speaks decent English, but the rest of the teachers will be um, very shy to speak with you and the volunteers, and it's one of the reasons why we do we put a lot of emphasis on the language component of the orientation program, um, because we want you to be able to communicate with not just the in Thai English teacher, but with your L uh, fellow Thai teachers as well. Um, in the classroom, it's you know you have either chalkboards or whiteboards, uh, but 
what's interesting about Thailand is the teachers have to provide school supplies. Part of what the monthly stipend goes towards is that is whiteboard markers, chalk, erasers, that sort of thing. It's kind of this is something that you find throughout Thailand. Um, some schools will have copiers, most will have printers, either the big school printer or you can usually borrow a printer from a fellow teacher. Um, some schools are equipped with projectors, which also helps decrease uh, copying and printing costs, which here can get expensive and also it can sometimes be problematic, especially during our rainy season, uh, because uh, just the paper jams, the uh, paper wrinkles up and things like uh, paper jams and machines break very easily because we are um, in a pretty rural area of Thailand. Um, most classroom sizes uh, for primary levels are 25 to 35. Uh, for prim uh, secondary schools, you'll see you'll maybe go up to 45. But it's a rare day that you will have to teach all of your students in a classroom because uh, what happens here is there are a lot of events in Thailand. So kids are routinely taken out for things like sports events and for Boy Scout events. Normally in the U.S. school system, and these kind of happen at, uh, after school during the extracurricular time, but in the Thai school system, if a, there's a soccer game, this happens during the school day. Um, and but it's there are limited besides copying and printing. There's a limited amount of resourcing. You shouldn't expect lamination, uh, and uh, you have to get creative with uh, the materials that you provide for your class. But that's half the fun with it. So, thanks. Awesome. That rooster seems like it's waking up everybody. Or. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Yeah, so no, it's great. <laughs> great. What's his What's his name? Does he have a Does he have a name? Uh, I call him Dinner because one of the days he's going to be dinner. <laughs> so just kidding. Uh, that's only when he wakes me up at three a.m. Um, uh, no, I think his name is like Tom or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. No, that was great. Uh, well, thank, no, thank you, Dan, and all seriousness for all, all that that information about the resources that are there. Um, Patricia, um, coming to you, um, will you tell us a bit about where and who you were teaching in Thailand, and also if you had taught before joining World Teach? Sure. Um, so I was teaching at two rural schools, elementary schools, um, in Ban Thai Samaki, and. Um, both of my schools each had about 60 students. They were pretty small, and I taught first grade through sixth grade. Uh, so my classroom size usually was between 10 to 20 students. I had very small classes, which isn't necessarily the standard, but um, I think because my my schools were so rural, it was just the way it was, and I, I felt really lucky for that. I really enjoyed um, teaching my classes. I had taught... Um, I had been an assistant teacher before for two years at an elementary school in Los Angeles, so I had a little bit of experience, but really nothing prepares you for that, so it was definitely a bit shocking at first, and it was just learning on the job, but a lot of fun and very, just very exciting. So, so where and... and you were teaching in the mm -hmm. same area. Who were you teaching as well, Patricia, during your time in Thailand? Um, who were my students? Yeah. They were, uh, oh, okay. um, so my students were uh, from rural communities around the area where I lived, and they were around between 5 to 11 years old. Um, and I also at times taught or had kind of um, tutoring sessions with my teachers as well, who were very excited to have a native speaker um, among them. So it, yeah, it was very new because most of the students had never met a native speaker before, and um, a lot of the teachers hadn't either, and they were very shy about their English at first, but. Um, the more I made a fool of myself by trying to speak Thai, the more they felt comfortable doing the same with me. So it 
it was really just me making an effort to reach out to them and then them realizing that it was a safe space that they could also um, do that with me. So that was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's something, it's so simple as long as you're trying and smiling. Uh, that's the best remedy. Uh, so, so going to the cultural portion of it as well, um, what was the biggest cultural challenge for you in the classroom? Um, just, I think the first part from the beginning being different, and I think that's something that doesn't really ever go away the entire year that you're there. You are going to be different, and people are going to point at you and say, oh, for them, and just point out that you're foreign and that you're tall or that you're pale or that you have a big nose. Um, all of these things are constantly going to be told to you. Um, and you just have to be okay with it, be okay with being different, with standing out, and with people being very curious about who you are and wanting to find out about you. So whenever you're out in the street or when you're with your students, there's always going to be questions. There's always going to be people coming up to you. and for no reason asking you questions or just wanting to reach out and say hello and maybe take a picture with you also. Just cause. Cool. Okay. Um, so just quickly as far as the actual teaching portion, um, was there anything that you struggle with the most in the classroom as far as the pedagogy or, or grammar or so on? Um, and also did you participate in the TEFL program? I did not participate in the TEFL program. That was um, that I think began two years after I left. Oh. Um, but the most difficult part of teaching was just not having that many resources and trying to figure out creative ways to reach out to the students because they couldn't understand what I was saying. Most of them had very very limited English, so just trying to get my point across and figure out ways in which to communicate with them, which over time you become very good at doing that and students kind of start understanding the way in which you teach and the way in which you work but um, yeah not having resources not really knowing where to begin um, because a lot of the textbooks that the students are provided with are especially the older they become they are way above their English level so they aren't very useful but finding where they're at and meeting them at their English level and teaching them from there. Is there an example resource that you want to share that you created during your time? Um, well, the I think the most effective way to teach for me was teaching with games. So going online, finding worksheets and games that were interesting and fun for the students, especially with songs. So. Even the Hokey Pokey was very useful, and the kids love doing that kind of stuff. So, or uh, bingo, printing out bingo games. Hmm. Um, it seems very simple, but it definitely reinforced the lessons that I tried to teach them, and it, the kids loved it. They had a lot of fun. Yeah, Hokey Pokey is, is I think it's pretty universal. Um, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Th thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, so, so quickly, um, just to go over for those listening in, um, the TUF certification, which uh, we're reminded by Patricia, um, came through a couple years after, around 2011, and has a relative cost of $350, where other TUFL certifications, especially in destination, are thousands of dollars. Um, the TUF certification will enable you to find full-time paid teaching positions, um, potentially in Thailand or in other parts of Southeast Asia and the world for that matter, um, once your volunteer experience at World Teach has ended. Uh, many of our volunteers do stay in country, like Patricia said, that she stayed next year after their year and continue teaching. Um, it is important to note that World Teach teachers are full-time teachers. So you could be in a class teaching for 25 hours a week, but also involved, uh, as is in Thailand, traditional curriculum, activities on campus and lesson planning uh, and sports activities, drama clubs and so on. So when school is in session, you are in session and when school is on vacation, you're on vacation. We can talk about that a bit more detail uh, during the Q&A session, but uh, that was great insight. Thank you guys. Um, moving along here, you'll see um, living in Thailand as well outside of the classroom. If and when you're accepted, you'll find out you'll find a volunteer profile form will be sent to you where you list your preferences on what age students you want to teach and what sort of environment you want to live in. For example, whether you prefer to live 
and work near other volunteers or you want to be further away. Based off your preferences and experiences, your field director will then place you according to where he thinks he or she thinks you'll be the most successful. You usually find out this placement a couple weeks before departure for Thailand, and all of our, our volunteers will be in the Nakampanam province, a rural region, and therefore volunteers won't be too far from each other, and most placements will be similar, varying between villages and small towns. Volunteers will either live with a host family or in teacher apartments. Some volunteers will be placed together, while others will be the only volunteer in their housing placement. We expect to have between 8 to 10 teachers in Thailand for this upcoming year. Uh, before we speak with the volunteers about their specific housing placements, or, or with Patricia, actually, um, Jen, can you address the range of accommodations and amenities that volunteers may or may not have? For example, the items listed here, as you can see, is there an AC or a fan, internet, western toilets, uh, yellow mellow, hot water or lack thereof, mm -hmm. hand washing of laundry, drinking water, and so on. Uh, can you just address some of those those basic yes. necessities. Um, so most housing uh, houses that volunteers live in are uh, the government housing that are provided. As a, the Thai government provides houses for its uh, for all of its teachers. So um, the this means that the state of the your housing is varied because it's dependent upon when the school gets uh, funds from Bangkok to kind of put in new things like western toilets or you know it's there for uh, but um, and like hot water and that sort of stuff so basic things that everyone you'll be able to everyone will get is this fan, bed, dresser, um, access to the equivalent of a Thai kitchen, which is in um, in a fridge and um, which is included in that, um, and access to a bicycle. Uh, some school, uh, some places, especially in the bigger cities, like if you do find yourself in a site placement like Nikomponom, you may have an AC unit. Most places do not. Um, likewise, some of the places do have a hot water uh, shower system, but most do not. Um, some volunteers right now do Thai bucket showers, um, and this is just very common throughout uh, Thailand. Some, um, most of our houses that we put volunteers do have western toilets, but there are a couple that are still squat toilets. Um, but it, overall, it's pretty, uh, the houses are decent, and if we try to make it, if you have any specific requests, the more specific you can be on your volunteer profile, the better uh, we can place you and fit a site placement that fits your housing requests and the type of school that you want to teach at and what uh, areas and subjects you're interested in teaching it. So, thanks. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Patricia, from your personal experience, um, can you tell us what your housing situation was like, who you live with, amenities you had or did not have, and maybe yeah. what your commute was like if you utilize one of those bikes? Yeah, sure. Um, so I lived in a house that was provided by one of the principals at one of the schools. Um, I lived with another volunteer. She also taught at two elementary schools. Um, and we had a house just to ourselves, which was a very basic house. It wasn't, um, it wasn't very fancy. It had a squatty potty and a little um, a little camp stove, camper stove thing, and um, we usually took bucket showers. Um, actually, the first month and a half that we were there, we didn't have any running water, so we got to know our neighbors because they would come and let us borrow some of their water, which was a very nice way to get to know the community. Um, and we would usually heat up water on the stove, and we also had a little kettle that we would use to heat up the water. Um, and yeah, we each had our own private bedroom, which had a uh, bed. The bed beds are usually made out of styrofoam, or at least ours were, and so they are not very comfortable. But 
over time, they start to form to your body, so it becomes a little bit more comfortable. And um, it was it was a really nice experience living there. Um, we would commute by we were given bicycles, but there were children's bikes. So I'm five ten. It was really hard for me to use a children's bike to get anywhere, but we would use it to go to the um, nearby market. Um, and to get to school, my teachers would come to pick me up. One of my teachers would pick me up um, in a motorized scooter, and so I got to ride in the back with her. Uh, and one of my other teachers picked me up in a truck to my other school. Was it a pickup truck? Yes. Okay. Um, so with that, on some of the transportation parts, what was your average weekend like? Um, what activities did you participate in outside of school or how you immersed yourself in the community? Uh, well, we sometimes would meet up with our neighbors and maybe have dinner with them. It wasn't very common, though. For the most part, we would end up staying in our little house and maybe going to the market, buying some stuff, making food. We would have other volunteers come to our house because our house was very cozy, so we often became a meeting point for a few other volunteers that were nearby and they would come spend the weekend with us. Or we would also um, hitchhike to Nakampanam City. We were about 20 minutes away. Um, and you can do that either by literally hitchhiking, seeing if somebody will pick you up, which being a foreigner, it's very likely that someone will stop and pick you up. Or you can also take a Songtail, which is like a, a pickup truck that is, is used as public transportation, kind of like a bus system. Um, and those would take us into the city as well. Okay. Um, so did you have a chance to to travel when you were there at all to other parts of Thailand? Yeah. Um, one of the great parts of being a teacher is that you get vacations off, and so we really took advantage of those times. And um, during the what would we consider the summer break, uh, we had six weeks to travel, and some of the other volunteers and I, we ended up going to uh, the Chiang Mai region, which is northern Thailand, and then down to the beaches in the south. And um, I would say that we were able to travel quite a bit. And even though the living stipend isn't, it doesn't seem like a lot of money, it's actually quite a bit in Thailand. And so we were able to save up enough money to make travel very possible. Um, traveling in Thailand is also not very expensive and it's not very difficult. So uh, we were able to see quite a bit. On the weekends it was much more difficult because um, being in a small town and also there isn't too much around the Isan area that's very touristy, so we would sometimes go to neighboring provinces like Sakonakon or Konkan, but uh, for the most part it was the weekends were very relaxed, very chill, just enjoying being in um, in our towns. Um, in general, uh, kind of creating a routine, the life yourself over the year, were there any particular difficult moments that you had? Um, I don't I don't think that there it was it was honestly not very difficult. I guess just figuring out how things work, figuring out the bus system, figuring out um, how to talk to people. But aside from that, we I would say that I was really lucky. I felt like my year there wasn't very difficult, and I enjoyed it quite a bit. Awesome. Um, so Jen, uh, just quickly, can you address the safety in Thailand in general? And then the Isan Valley you know, area specifically, um, what sort of healthcare access do people have near their placements? So it's loaded. Um, okay. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. It's also uh, just safety uh, in this area is actually pretty. You're, it's a pretty safe area, and it's especially when even when there are big things, you know, uh, happening down south. There's up here, nothing's ever happening. Um, uh, it's because it's so isolated and people are like, ah, oh, it's, you know, there's, people are 
there, uh, I'm thinking of the last um, ish bombing in Bangkok. When that happened, people kind of up here just went, so there's another bombing in Bangkok. Uh, like, well, not another, but this happened. It's a, we're sad about this, but up here, it's not, it's so isolated and it's a relatively safe area um, and much safer. I think it's probably, I've lived all around Thailand and this is probably the safest area that I've ever lived. Um, in terms of hospitals, uh, there are a couple big hospitals in the Kompanom province itself and in Isa, um, in the Kompanom city, uh, there's the Kompanom hospital that is, you know, has a a f it is an international hospital, so for basic things like if you get a bad stomach virus, you can totally go there. It's within uh, 30 to 45 minutes of most teaching sites, and you just have to coordinate, um, call, tell either one of your Thai teachers, or call me, and we'll, or call your field director, and we'll get you into the hospital if it um, and get you sorted out and if it's a bigger issue um, Bangkok is we're really lucky in fact that Bangkok has two of the top 10 hospitals in the world and they specialize in medical tourism um, so they are really really good and they have amazing English and um, and now, actually, it's very easy to go down to Bangkok because when I first came to town, this kind of tells you how much this province has changed just since when I was a volunteer. When I was first a volunteer, there were, it was overnight buses to Bangkok, 12 hours, but now we have four daily flights to Bangkok and they take about an hour. The plane fares to Bangkok are about maybe a little bit more expensive than the bus tickets, but it's still relatively cheap. So it's not difficult to, if, if you need medical attention, it's not difficult to get you down to an urban center where you can get really good medical care. Thanks. Yes. No, thank you. That's, that's really good facts, uh, especially about the hospitals in Bangkok and how desensitized they are also to things going on that seem like a, a world away. Um, so, just continuing on, as Jen kind of and Patricia alluded to, there is a monthly stipend uh, for the volunteers, and it's relatively the same amount as an average teacher makes in that area in the province. Um, and as mentioned, um, relative cost of living in that area and how volunteers have that stipend, uh, Patricia was able to, to save and use some of that stipend on her traveling. Um, if the volunteer lives in school-provided housing, they should not have to pay utilities. In the past, some volunteers lived in housing that the schools rented out for them, and they may have to pay for Internet. Um, Patricia, the, did you have to pay for Internet at all? And what was your also, what was your meal situation like on a daily basis? Uh, yes, we had to pay for Internet. Um, the house did not have Internet before we got there, so the Internet was put into the house specifically for our use. Um, and as far as the meals go... I was given breakfast and lunch at my school um, every day that I taught, which was not very common. Most of the other volunteers only received lunch, and we think that's probably because I'm a vegetarian, so they kind of felt bad for me, and they were very worried that I wasn't going to eat enough or that I might die of starvation, so they ended up feeding me a lot. Um, and But for the most part, they were very... They took very good care of all the volunteers in terms of food. Um, any event that we had, they would always make sure that we were well fed. And we were also given a stipend for food. And food in Thailand is just very cheap. You can go into the city and get Pad Thai for less than a dollar. Um, and that's going to a restaurant. So making it yourself or making any sort of food, going to the market, buying vegetables, it's very, very cheap. and very fresh, very good. That sounds good. Hungry. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the, <laughs> for sharing that uh, with us. Um, see, uh, just relative in cost, just going uh, outside of the U.S. at some points, it, it that comes a bit of a shock to someone who hasn't done it before. Um, as you look here, this is kind of the application process and the volunteer qualifications. 
applications or applicants for our year-long programs like Thailand must be native English speakers of any nationality and hold a bachelor's degree. You do not have to have teaching experience. However, a commitment to serving and learning and volunteering and a flexible attitude are requirements. You do not need to know Thai. It will not hurt or help your application. The required application items are listed here as well as on our website. And the process concludes with a phone or Skype interview with our admissions team. So applications for our World Teach Thailand program are being accepted till February 15th, about three weeks from now. And the decisions are usually made on a rolling basis quickly in two or three weeks after the application is completed. Volunteers depart in early April and return in March of 2017. So we had some a couple questions come in uh, as we had signups for attendees for the webinar. So I'm going to start going through a couple of the questions that came along and also questions from other years uh, that we seem to be most relevant. Um, if you have any questions for those who are listening and you'd like to chat them in, please do them now. Uh, Patricia, quickly, what, what Thai customs or cultural aspects did you struggle with at the beginning? Um, was there anything that kind of shocked you? about things that would go on. I know you alluded to them a bit earlier. Well, I guess um, something that might be a little bit hard to deal with, especially as Americans, we're kind of very independent. And um, when you go to Thailand, especially being a foreigner, people are going to try to take care of you all of the time. And that was a little bit difficult at first. Our first night, um, my roommate and I living in our house, we had the entire community come to our house to do a welcoming ceremony. And it was a very tiring night just because it was so such a long day moving into our home and then having all these people that we didn't know coming over and being like, hi, how are you? If you need anything, come and talk to us. And here, have some food and let me tie some strings around your wrist. So it was just very overwhelming. But um, the more time you spend there, the more you kind of just embrace it. You realize that it's them trying to take care of you. and um, So it's it's hard to deal with at first, especially when you feel like they're just being very, they're getting in your, you feel like they're getting into your business a lot. They, um, they would invite me to go to the temple, and I'm not a very religious person, and so it felt like they were trying to force me into their beliefs, but that wasn't the case at all. It's just them being very hospitable, taking care of you, making sure that you're okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, we had a couple questions coming in. So one was a professional working experience of four years. Is that going to hamper my chance of getting in? No, four years is, is, uh, is great. Um, there was a mention with age. Um, most of our programs, uh, do not have an age limit, um, but our partners in Thailand, it's pretty specific with the age of 40. But Jeanette, who is listening in, you can definitely send your information to Info World Teach and we can see what we can do as far as talking to our partners. Um, but a, a further question here, um, Patricia as well. Um, did you know any Thai language when you first got there? Um, and what did you do? What were some of the things you did to practice to enhance your language? No. When I first got here, I knew almost nothing. In the moment in which I was accepted into the program, I got a Rosetta Stone for Thai, and I started practicing that. But Thai is a very difficult language, and not having anyone to practice with, it's not very... I didn't really learn anything before I got to Thailand. Um, when I first got here, we had our month-long training, and we had Thai teachers come in to teach us some of the basics, which was really great. It was amazing how how patient they were with us because we were terrible and we were we knew nothing. Um, but once I got into my school, I guess just just trying to practice with people and having your Thai teachers correct you and really making making an effort to reach out to um, to your teachers and to your students. And I mean, trying to practice Thai during class is not appropriate, but outside of class, after school, I would sit down with my kids and I would practice some words with them, and they loved it. Um, it's a little bit difficult at first because 
for the most part, when people see that you're a foreigner and that you are an English speaker, they're much more interested in practicing their English. But just making the effort to practice with people and in your free time, if you have any sort of Thai language books, you know, taking maybe like 15, half an hour, 15 minutes or half an hour a day to sit down and maybe practice a little bit. And then when you go to school or when you're with other teachers, just trying to practice. Constant immersion, always learning. Um, <laughs> so food, which is on everyone's mind, uh, probably at all times throughout the day. Um, what what was the food like uh, for you, Patricia? Um, you mentioned the pad thai for a dollar in your local town, but talk about some of the other foods that you experienced and, and just give your overall view. And, and after Patricia says, Jen, uh, please, please feel free. Uh, don't Not about dinner or the rooster, but, but anything else that you've been exposed to. Um, <laughs> please, please elaborate on that. So Patricia, please let us know how was your food experience. The food in Thailand is amazing. It's so delicious. And um, there's a lot of things that I have never tasted before of Thai food that I got to experience for the first time being there. Also, being a vegetarian can be a little bit tricky. Um, people do not really understand vegetarianism. The most they understand of it is that monks are vegetarian, and so they, they will make very bland food <laughs> for vegetarians because they think that that's a religious thing, they, um, and for the most part, monks are eat very bland food. They're, it's very, it's, it's very different from what is the normal food. Uh, so my experience was sometimes a little bit sad because I, um, because people didn't really know what to feed me. I was very difficult in being a vegetarian. Um, oftentimes they would just give me some some boiled vegetables and an egg because they weren't really sure how to feed me, but just communicating with people and letting them understand what your diet restrictions are. Uh, my teachers and my schools were um, very, very eager to understand my, my diet and very, very happy to accommodate for my dietary restrictions, which I was very grateful for. Um, but overall, the food was great. It was cheap, and it was very fresh. Just amazing. Hopefully, it picked up spice uh, as it went along. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, Jen, Jen, tell me a little bit about your experience as well with food um, and your time. Okay. So, yeah, um, spice is definitely something that all uh, spice tolerance is. If you don't have it to begin with, don't worry. Because uh, we will build it up. Um, Isan, so in the northeast part of Thailand, or Isan, uh, Isan food is known for being particularly spicy, and um, there are the most famous dishes called the like spicy paya salad, but it also has um, they do a lot of dishes with sticky rice. It is very cheap, but yeah, issue people who are, have dietary restrictions, like they're, if you're a vegetarian, um, that is something that you definitely want to let us know because that um, affects your site placement. Um, I, we would try to put you in a place where you will be, if you can or not buy next door to a market, you at least have easy access to a market and or can get into the city where you can have access to bigger stores and can get um, vegetarian friendly food or a food that's specific to your diet very easily because it is, especially in the rural provinces, it, you are eating what your neighbors see and up here there's uh, people eat a lot of fish, chicken, eggs in particular are very popular, um, sticky rice and spice. Um, and But it's very fresh and unlike a lot of other parts of Thailand where some of the food can get really greasy, up here the diet is actually um, since it is so fresh and you're, it, it's you know vegetables that your neighbors will pick um, in their backyard, it's 
very healthy overall, but um, it does take some getting used to, and it takes an open mind. Um, and it's, but it's also one of the great things about it because if you can kind of, if you travel around other parts of Thailand and you tell them that you can, you eat Isan food on a regular basis, that people, you'll see all the Thais kind of stand back and they'll definitely appreciate you and they'll think that that's really cool because not a lot, a lot of uh, foreigners uh, can, uh, are interested in eating uh, this uh, region are are up for eating the spices from this uh, in the food in this region and likewise uh, to kind of touch base back on the language stuff um, not only is there Thai up here but you'll also uh, probably pick up the Isan dialects and because um, it's a cool Thai Lao fusion so I started learning Thai really seriously when I got here and. As a result, it's kind of funny because I always, even when I go down to Bangkok, I speak with an Isan accent, but it's a, um, it makes it really nice if you ever want to go and travel over in Laos and that sort of stuff because you have an ear. If you pick it up up here, you, have, you develop an ear um, so you can travel very easily and it, um, over to Laos, which we're right next door, so it's... A cool place, and there's cool languages uh, besides Thai as well that you uh, can are exposed to. Thanks. Thanks, Jane, Patricia. Um, all those elaborations. I think uh, the amount of information you've shared. Um, any final comments, Jen, that you want to share with anyone who's considering doing something like this? And Patricia, same with you. Jen, we'll start with you. Any final words? Uh, yeah, I would just say the kind of biggest things that people don't expect, uh, there are three things that people don't expect when they move to a place like this. One, they aren't expecting that uh, they will have, there's so much emphasis on appearance. Frequently they think that, you know, our perceptions of coming to Thailand are the Thai backpacker style, but here, um, appearance and looking put together on a day-to-day -day basis is um, very important and when you put in this emphasis, uh, put in a little effort in your appearance, um, it goes a long way in your community but you have to keep an open mind for that and you can't be discouraged by that. Um, second point is uh, definitely a uh, the more you uh, are willing to extend yourself and invest yourself in your community and step outside your comfort zone, this is a place that will you put a little into your community, you get tons back. So you, when you come in here in any sort of experience like this, you uh, want to be up for anything because um, um, just with the volunteers who are. I, uh, that we have a really kind of game for traveling to this temple, that temple, you really kind of see a t part of Thailand that you, you get to experience a part of Thailand that you wouldn't otherwise. Um, and finally, uh, the more you put, again, I'm just going to hit, uh, I've mentioned this before, but the more you let us know about yourself in the application process, the more we can make this uh for uh, your site placement and talk to your our teaching partners about you ahead of time because they are very interested in knowing when we do site placements they're very interested in knowing about our volunteers and that sort of stuff and they want to know you know they'll probably they usually ask for photos of you guys immediately and that sort of stuff so if I know more about you guys from the get-go and what you're hoping to get out of this experience um, and you're, I can communicate that with the teaching partners, the, I think the happier everyone is in the long run. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Patricia, any final words for potential volunteers? Yeah, um, just to um, reiterate what Jen is saying, really. Um, I think the most important things to keep in mind when you come here are to be flexible and to 
just know that you're going to stand out and people are going to be very curious about that. But flexibility is really key. I would go to class a lot of times and I would teach four classes a day or four hours a day and sometimes my class would get canceled for no reason or oftentimes I would be told to take on another class just because, because the teacher might have been absent or because the students um, these students needed to be uh, taken apart or, uh, from the rest of the group. Um, just keeping in mind that you might have a plan of what your day is going to look like, and that is not the way your day is going to end up turning out. So um, just always keeping in mind that things are going to fall apart. Um, you're not going to get to go through with your plan. Sometimes um, you're going to have to play soccer with your students, and your students are going to love you for that. <laughs> um, it might not have been part of your plan for the day, but it, it ends up working out and ends up being really great. And um, also punctuality is not very, not what a lot of people expect it to be. Um, a lot of the other volunteers sometimes would get frustrated with that, that um, they ended up wasting a lot of time. But it's just the way it's going to be and you have to come prepared for um, things taking longer than they're supposed to and um, taking on responsibilities that you weren't prepared to take on. So, but it all works out. Hmm. No, that's that, that's great advice, uh, Patricia. It's uh, you flow like a river and, and sometimes society, societies are different. There's individualism versus collectivism, which we've heard here as well as this, this mono versus polychromatic idea of what our perception of time is and, and how that does differ in, in countries. So that's really useful information. Um, thank you again, Jen and Patricia, for joining us. Um, you'll see here, for those who are interested in continuing on in their journey, potentially being a volunteer, there's reading alumni reviews, which you'll see in the bottom at gooverseas.com. We have a number of country experts who are out there we have willing to speak to in more detail. And there's on YouTube, we have various day in the life videos of Thailand volunteers. And this recording will be sent out to you. Um, like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all those LinkedIn, all those fun social media outlets. Um, but again, thanks for those who tuned in. And to Jen and Patricia, thank you so much. And uh, take care. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks.